Gutierrez 11th Annual Public Lecture. Good evening. Uh, as many of you already know, Sierra is Northwestern's uh, research center uh, with the mission of advancing interdisciplinary research, uh, connecting astronomy and astrophysics to other disciplines from physics, math, and statistics, and engineering. Uh, it is hard to believe that uh, we are starting our second decade, this is the 11th uh, annual lecture, and we're all thrilled to have you with us tonight. Like last year, we're also proud to be the kickoff event for the homecoming weekend. Uh, I hope you all enjoy the programming throughout the weekend, and I would like to extend a special welcome to our uh, alumni from the local community and also from out of town. Now this year, we're also excited to be uh, part of the One Book, One Northwestern programming, uh, the Common Read program hosted by the Office of the President. Our One Book programming spans the whole academic year, and just in the fall quarter, Sierra is organizing or co-organizing four to five events. One Book this year is Hidden Figures by Margot Shetterly, coinciding with 150 years of co-education at Northwestern. Uh, many, many, many years ahead of time compared to many of our peers now. And 80 years since a woman joined the faculty uh, who would later become a tenured full professor. As a steering committee member, I'm more than happy, I'm actually proud tonight to be hosting our speaker, a good friend and a colleague, Professor Priya Nadarajan, uh, uh, because her work her book uh, uh, is aligned with Sierra's mission uh, and with the one book uh, program. Professor Nat Natarajan is a theoretical astrophysicist in cosmology. She has made pioneering contributions in this field, also gravitational lensing and black hole physics. She is particularly well known for having shown how gravitational lensing of clusters of galaxies can actually help us to constrain models and theories of dark energy. She's also deeply committed towards um, institutional change with regard to gender parity in the academy, and she is engaged in understanding the history and philosophy of science as well as technology and public policy. At Yale, she is currently a professor of astronomy and physics um, and the director of the Frankie program in science and the humanities. She's also the Sophie and Tycho Brahe professor at the Niels Bohr Institute in Denmark. She started as an undergraduate in physics and mathematics at MIT. She did her PhD in astronomy at Cambridge University with Martin Rees and she has been elected fellow of the American Physical Society and the Royal Astronomical Society. And in the recent years, apart from her research, she has been a very active published author of op-eds in the New York Times, Washington Post, Huffington Post, and CNN. And in 2016, she published um, an award-winning book, Mapping the Heavens, the Radical Scientific Ideas that Reveal the Cosmos. It's a highly rated book on Amazon.com and has been hailed by New York Times' Richard Holmes as a strikingly lucid account of the expansion, not just of the universe, but of the way we have tried to understand it. It's a great pleasure to host her tonight and have her as our speaker for the 11th uh, public lecture. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming out, and I want to say thanks to Vicky for both the very kind introduction as well as the invitation to come and speak to you all today. So I have actually watched Sierra grow and glow from inception, and it's absolutely fabulous to see what they have built here in terms of just intellectual prowess, and the fact that it was done in 10 years is really, really impressive. So I wanted to talk about um, cartography of the cosmos and mapping the unseen. So from a very young age, I was quite obsessed with maps. And in particular, what I loved about maps was the fact that while maps charted what we know, if you look at ancient maps, older maps of geographical maps of terra firma, they would also be places marked as terra incognita. 
So there was an admission that there are things that you don't know. So I treat maps as a way of understanding the boundary between what is known now, what remains to be discovered. So at some level, it's the frontier of discovery, and that's what maps actually denote. So um, as Vicky mentioned, um, I wrote a book a couple of years ago in which I tried to use my love of maps and use maps as a metaphor to look at the radical scientific ideas that have shaped our understanding of the cosmos over the last hundred years. And the last hundred years are particularly important because they've been really transformative and they have seen the convergence of ideas, instruments, technologies, and we are able to see, we've been able to see much farther, deeper into the cosmos and therefore refined our understanding of the cosmos quite remarkably. And so as I mentioned, I really see mapping as a way of knowing and as a way of charting what we know at a given time. So prior to the sort of the practice of science where people were writing as a scientific community, a professionalized scientist writing papers like we do now, people often made maps or charts. And so looking historically at how our view of the cosmos has changed, we can just look at maps and we learn a lot about what maps really tell us. So I, one of the other motivations for writing this book was that you know, we live at a very troubling time um, in the United States at the moment, which is rampant denialism of science. And so I wanted to sort of unpack how science works and to provide a broad understanding of what scientists actually do. And so uh, in the book, I also show that even scientists trained as we are to be very nimble in our understanding. So, you know, ideas uh, are subject to change when you have better data, you have more evidence. You have to change your um, mental frame of understanding because you're compelled to with the data and the evidence. So you have to be very nimble. You can't be fixed in how you think. And I wanted to showcase how even though scientists are brought up to be nimble and change their mind, be open to changing their mind, there's resistance because psychologically we as human beings are resistant to change, particularly if those changes mean a disorienting worldview, as we will see. And so I wanted to showcase that and show sort of case studies of some of the radical ideas over the past hundred years, as I said. But I'm particularly interested in the history of ideas. I have an interest. So let me take you through a very quick journey, uh, focusing a little bit on the history of maps and how human beings have actually wanted to map both the sky and the earth in a way to actually span the gap between the terrestrial and the celestial. So this is one of the earliest maps that we know of the night sky. It's called the Nebra Sky Disk, probably dated to between 2000 and 1600 BC, found in the um, saxony anhalt region in Germany. So it's a copper plate. And you can see the sun, you see the crescent moon. And we believe that some of those copper dots that you see are the, per the <coughs> Perseus, or the Pleiades cluster, sorry of stars that you see in the night sky that would have been visible from where this was this artifact was excavated why they map the night sky what the purpose of this we do not know but we probably you can probably imagine that the minute neanderthals were able to look up and look at the night sky they were probably fascinated and they started uh, mapping of course what we are more familiar with are maps of terra firma of the earth so one of the earliest maps was Ptolemy's Geographica, in which you can see that the growing understanding of the world, as I will show you some maps over time, we can see how our view of what was on Earth, continents, other continents, other cities, other civilizations, slowly grew. And very, very analogously to how we now got to know the cosmos. So we were able to map a small portion of the cosmos and over the last hundred years, we have been able to unveil a much better cosmic view, a much more sophisticated cosmic view. So I'm using these maps of the Earth as a proxy. This is one of my favorite maps of the night sky. And this is an illuminated map from about 1375. So in this, the worldview is still very much as the Earth in the center, there's the fixed heavens and the stars, 
But what is really interesting about this map, and I keep telling you that they encode ideas, for the first time, there is a, a hint that people are thinking about causes. So you see these two angels trying to turn the crank to explain the seasons and maybe night and day. So the first time you start looking at maps, not just as depictions, but as devices that force you to think about causation. What is the reason, right? And in a way, cosmology really as a subject derives from now the reason studied through science and instrumentation and data and evidence for what we can see in the cosmos. But this is my all-time favorite map. It's from the Catalan Atlas. Uh, it dates to about 1375. And what is special about this map is compared to all other maps, you, the shift that you see in this one is previously all these maps, these elaborate depictions of the night sky, phases of the moon, and so on, would have in the center a god-like figure. It would be sort of a figure with the beard, sort of sagely god-like figure, which is supposed to represent the divine. So it's a divine creation. This is the first time where you have these four angels at the corners that are holding not God, but an astrolabe. So an instrument taking the measure of the cosmos becomes something that is very acceptable. And this is a move towards sort of the precursor to historical measurements that we can make of the cosmos. That the cosmos is something that we can take the measure of. We can question, we can collect data, and so on. So it appears for the first time in this map. It's really quite remarkable. And of course, there are many other maps of, um, that were made that focus on very particular aspects. And the reason I want to show this is because when I talk about ideas in cosmology, I'm going to show you particular kinds of diagrams that are focused on one sort of phenomenon, right? So here, for example, you see a map of an imaginary map of an imaginary place, of ut utopia, what utopia is supposed to be like, right? And <clears throat> the various depiction of utopia itself, so two different depictions of what this promised land, this happy place would be. And of course, I should jump right back now into um, maps that were made of the celestial sphere. So in 1543, 1543 to 1548, Copernicus started to reorder the cosmos. The cosmos at the time was just the solar system. So that was the extent of our cosmic view. We did not know about anything beyond the solar system. And of course, Copernicus reordered the universe. That was extremely radical was a very, very radical new idea compared to the Ptolemaic Aristotelian view where the Earth was at the center. So, but then that was so radical that it was pretty hard for people to accept that readily. So there was like a halfway house. So there was an intermediate model which then helped people get comfortable with the fact that this Earth was not at the center of the cosmos. And so this is a depiction, a very elaborate depiction trying to reconcile Copernicus and the old view. And so what you see is the Earth is really at the center, but there are a lot of other planets that are going around the sun. Some are going around the Earth and some are going around the sun. So it's kind of a halfway house. And one of the reasons I want to show you this is this is what often happens with very radical scientific ideas, even in cosmology. When you can't accept the full extent of what the evidence is telling you, you march a little closer and you slowly accept the evidence. So it's that process. And I find that process very, very fascinating. And of course, you know, after that, we know that the Copernican view of the universe was established. You have the sun at the center, and the universe at this time was just the solar system. And <clears throat> where are we now? So I'm going to just jump ahead to where we are now. So where we are now is we have a very, very comprehensive map over time since the beginning of the universe, the, uh, the time that we mark as t equals zero, which we refer to as the Big Bang, all the way to today, we have a timeline of the formation of structure in the universe, the formation of the first stars, and we have a timeline that we can now date to 13.8 billion years. So we have an exquisite understanding of how all of this structure formed from the initial sea of matter, which had a small amount of fluctuation in it. 
these fluctuations grew over time and coagulated to form the galaxies, the stars, everything that we actually see. But what is remarkable about what we know today though, although I told you we have this exquisite picture, there's some very intriguing aspects to this picture in the sense that though we know how the universe looks and how it came to be, what drives and shapes the universe, we know how these things manifested, we don't know their nature. So for example, when we do a full cosmic inventory of the universe, which we can do now, we find that most of the matter in the universe is actually not the stuff that we are made of. So the ordinary atoms that we are made of, everything on the periodic table, is barely 5% of the entire cosmic inventory. Most of the rest of the dark matter, more than 90% of all the matter in the universe, is some peculiar thing called dark matter. And we know it's matter because it has gravity, it feels gravity. We don't know what the particle is. So we know that dark matter is in the driving seat of forming all the galaxies that we see, and I'll show you a little more in detail later. But we don't know what it is. We know what it does, we don't know what it is. Similarly, the bulk of the universe appears to be 72% is this other mysterious component that is called dark energy. We know what it does. It causes the expansion of the universe to accelerate. So much as when you're sitting in your car, you have to press the gas pedal to actually accelerate, so the gas pedal to the universe is provided by this thing, this mysterious entity called dark energy. Once again, we don't know what it is. And, but we know what it does, that it powers the accelerating expansion of the universe. So you might all wonder, in cosmology, um, we tend to really kind of deify Einstein. Right? So we're like, oh my god, Einstein's theory of general relativity was just hugely transformative. And the reason it was transformative is because of the profound insight that he had. And the profound insight that he had was that the contents, the geometry, and the fate of the universe are interlinked. So if you know any two things, you can figure out the third. And so this was like, you know, um, this formulation of general, the theory of general relativity, not only did it transform our understanding of gravity, which till then, from the 1600s, was Newton's theory of gravity, the gravity, the fact that if you have two, two bits of matter, that they attract each other, force of gravity, and the strength of this force falls off as one of the square of the distance between them and so on. So that was the established understanding. And Einstein upended it completely. And he upended it by reformulating it completely because Newton also could tell you what gravity does. It's an attractive force and how it operates, but he could not tell you the nature of gravity. He couldn't tell you why that is so, right? And so Einstein's theory, <clears throat> one of the most fundamental things that Einstein's theory does is it reshaped our understanding of space and time. So he postulates this four-dimensional thing, a more complicated sheet, rather than just a normal three-dimensional spatial sheet that we are all familiar with or think of space as, he integrated time into it. And then he was able to show that space is not really a fixed grid. And in fact, it's a bendable fabric. And what gravity is, is really the geometric change in shape, the deformation in this fabric that you get when you plop matter onto it. So you can think of this sheet of space-time as a sheet, and every piece of matter be it a small little meteor, a little rock in the solar system, the Earth, galaxies would form a little dent. The sun would make a little dent, a divot in this fabric of space-time. And remember, the space-time is the universe. There's nothing above it, there's nothing below it. So all the motions of the planets, galaxies, what have you, light, are confined to this sheet. So light rays in the universe from a distant object, for example, would have to follow up and down all these potholes on their way to us. So whatever matter, so matter in the universe pockmarks space-time. So this is radical reformulation, completely radically different way of thinking about what gravity really is. And so to give you a sense, so if there was no matter in the universe, we could think of this sheet as being completely flat. So for example, the sun, that's a cartoon that shows you that the sun, the kind of divot the sun would form. So that's a kind of um, lump. The lump of the sun would cause that kind of deformation. If you look at a neutral 
neutron star, which is much more tightly packed. The matter in a neutron star is much more tightly packed than the sun. It's much more dense. And so you can see the pothole is deeper, right? So it's a deeper pothole. It generates a deeper pothole. So the, the denser and the more compact an object is, the pothole is deeper and it's sharper in terms of <clears throat> where um, the shape of the pothole that's generated. So a black hole, on the other hand, causes a puncture in space-time. So that's how intense the, uh, the density and the gravity of a black hole is, that it causes a puncture in the fabric of space-time. So <clears throat> one of the other things that Einstein's theory of general relativity tells you, as I told you, this kind of combination, this sort of uh, between the shape and the fate of the geometry, so his equations that describe this connection, this deep connection, have three solutions, only three <coughs> possible solutions. And what we mean by solutions are three specific combinations of geometry, fate, and context. So those three solutions are shown in those curves that you see on the left-hand side. And what you have, uh, what is plotted there, is the size scale of the universe over time, over cosmic time. So one of the solutions is that the universe starts at a big bang, expands, reaches a maximum size, and then turns back on itself. And then there is one where the universe starts out expanding and expands forever. And then there's one, it starts off, expands, and it kind of lingers. So the whole quest, in, of course, these three fates correspond to three very unique geometries. Each of them implies a very specific geometry. One of them is completely flat space-time, the other is space-time that's bent like a Pringles chip, and the other one is the surface of a sphere. And so the goal in cosmology has been trying to pin down which of these solutions is the best description for our universe, right? And there are some really cool properties of each of these geometries about you know, what would happen to light rays and how they would get bent around um, and so on. So let me now delve. So this was just a little primer for the baseline of what we have in terms of the contents and the geometry and the fate of the universe. Now let me quickly take you through some of the extremely radical scientific ideas that, uh, as I mentioned, have shaped our cosmic understanding. So I'll talk a little bit about the discovery of the expansion of the universe. So Hubble, Edwin Hubble, the astronomer, discovered the expansion of the universe in 1929. And that was a very disorienting discovery because it sort of unfixed the universe. Till then, the universe was considered to be sort of a fixed, not moving, static. And this was very disorienting. It was very hard to understand. It, even now, it's sort of a counterintuitive um, a sense. You can't really get an intuitive sense of what that means, but I'll try my best to give you a feel for it. Then the discovery of dark energy, this dominant component that I told you is driving the accelerating expansion of the universe. And I'll talk a little bit about dark matter, and then I'll talk about black holes. So first, <clears throat> till 1914, we did not know, remember I told you like right up around Copernicus's time and all the way up to 19, the 1900s, we did not know about the existence of any other galaxy. So it was only in 1914 that we knew that, okay, we were one galaxy amongst many. And that is also something that Hubble was able to show, that the nearby galaxy Andromeda is actually a different entity. It's a galaxy like our own, but it's separate from us. And that the universe, it opened up the possibility that there were billions and billions of galaxies in the universe. But this was the first start. So right after that discovery, um, Hubble was also able to show that the universe was expanding. And what do we really mean by that? So this is, um, this is a figure from his early paper where he found that the farther another galaxy, an external galaxy was from us, it was hurtling away faster from us. And the only way to reconcile the motions of these other galaxies that were scattered around us, the fact that they were hurtling away, was that space itself had to be expanded. So this is one way to think about it. So the way to think about it is that what do I mean by the expansion of the universe? I actually mean that the spaces between galaxies actually grows. So if you drew an imaginary grid on space, so what Hubble found was that it is the grid itself that is expanding over time. So that's the way to think about it. So our own galaxy is not expanding. 
And as we know, even on Earth, the distance between, say, Evanston and Rome is not changing, right? So once you are inside a galaxy, a galaxy is like a closed box. So the galaxy itself does not expand with the universe. The distances between two neighboring galaxies changes. And that's what we mean by expansion. So it's the underlying space itself that is stretching out. And this stretching of space actually stretches out light rays as they traverse through the universe. And so this is an effect that is measured and it is exploited to actually figure out where objects are. Just looking, you know, every cosmic object has a unique fingerprint, its spectrum, that tells you how much energy is coming out of this object that is emitting. And because of the stretching of the wavelength of light, we are able to simultaneously figure out both the speed with which something is hurtling away and therefore how far away it is from us. And then in 1998, so if you thought this expanding universe sounds complicated and complex, in 1998, so it's that recent, right, just 20 years ago, astronomers discovered that the expansion of the universe was actually accelerating. It was not a constant rate, but it was actually accelerating expansion. That was even more disorienting. So, and what that tells you is that there is a mysterious force. Something has to be powering this accelerating expansion. And it turns out that it's this entity called dark uh, energy. So dark energy was just discovered very, very recently. And you might say, okay, this is um, kind of nice, but it's kind of academic, is it? Actually, it's not academic. The reason this is interesting is the nature of dark energy, what exactly it is, is going to determine the ultimate fate of our universe whether we kind of crunch back, whether we have a big rip, a hot crunch, or we just become a cool, desolate universe where the nearest galaxy to us is going to be so much farther away that the night sky is actually going to look really dark. So the end fate. So at the moment, at the present time, we have determined this is what the universe is doing. But what it's going to end up doing in the far future is going to really depend on what this mysterious dark energy is. And that's one of the big open questions that astronomers are currently looking at. So um, let me now move on to another big idea, and that is the idea of dark matter. So this was remember another unseen entity that seems to shape the universe as we see it. So the evidence for dark matter comes by, you could either be a Newtonian or devotee of uh, Isaac Newton, or you could be a devotee of Einstein, and you would still infer that there is dark matter in the universe. And that is what is so compelling about the idea. And people often ask me, right, is this dark matter for real or is it going to go away like ether, right? So there was this uh, ether, the idea that there was this all-pervasive medium, and that went away. It turns out that light does not need a medium to travel, unlike sound. So that was, um, <clears throat> that was wrong. But it turns out that the evidence for dark matter is so compelling, even though we have not yet found the particle. There are many, many experiments underway right now to pin down what this particle is. But once again, we know what it does. So if you, if you treat a galaxy and think about a galaxy and the motion of the stars in a galaxy like Newton would have, if we didn't have these fanciful ideas, fabric of space time or whatever, we just use Newton's theory of gravitation, then the measurements that were made by Vera Rubin and her collaborators in the 1970s were really puzzling. I'll just show you in a minute what was so puzzling. However, so that you have evidence for dark matter, you have very compelling evidence, if even with just that argument. But then, if you move back to Einstein's picture of this fabric and distortions and light traveling through all these distortions, then you once again get very, very compelling evidence for the existence of dark matter. And when you look at objects in which you can do both of these kinds of measurements, the amount of dark matter that you should have agrees. So, you know, I think that's a very, very compelling case for dark matter. So the first proposal for the evidence for dark matter actually came very early. So one of the reasons I'm giving you a sense of this time is to just show you that it takes quite a while for many of these radical ideas to be proposed and then for them to be actually accepted even though there's some initial first evidence, right? So you have to gather a lot of evidence before the idea gets accepted even within the scientific community. So there's pushback before that. So in 1933 and 1937, uh, Swiss astronomer Fritz Zwicky, who's a bit of a cantankerous uh, kind of character who was at Caltech, he discovered that um, he looked at the speeds of, um, of galaxies in an object called the Cluster of Galaxies, 
which is about a thousand galaxies that appear to be held together by gravity. They, they are an entity that are held together. So there are very coherent motions of these galaxies, about a thousand galaxies that appear to be held together in orbit. So he looked at the motions of those galaxies and he said, well, if there had to be a gravitating mass that was holding everything together, shaping these motions that he was measuring in a nearby coma cluster of galaxies, um, then there had to be a lot more mass than is revealed by the light in the galaxies. Because galaxies have mass because they have stars, so you can weigh that, you can weigh the light, you know, how much, uh, how much light different kinds of stars emit. And so you could total up the mass, and he found that you were off by a factor of 10. There had to be 10 times more matter to explain the motions that you see than, um, than you actually see in the light. And then nobody was convinced. You know, this paper kind of was there. And, and, you, know, and you know, Zwicky had, a, actually, actually, he came up with a lot of ideas. Many of them were significantly important and have made, he's made major contributions, but he had a lot of misses. So people said, okay, this is super crazy. But you know, he didn't give up. In 1937, you know, he said, okay, if the Newton idea doesn't work, if people aren't compelled by this motions and doing up the tally a la Newton, let me use Einstein in my toolbox and make an argument. And so he then said, okay, if space-time is bent and the light rays are bent, then the shapes of distant galaxies that lie behind a big lump of mass that has made a huge divot should look very distorted. And so he said, well, he can calculate it, how much matter there should be and what the kind of distortion you should be able to see. Unfortunately, the distortions were tiny and they were not observable at the time. So once again, the idea kind of stayed around and nothing much happened till the 1970s. Um, as I mentioned, Vera Rubin and her colleagues were measuring, uh, they were doing a completely different measurement. And you know, and it turns out, I looked at the archives, they were not aware of, that's how marginal Zwicky's ideas were. They were not, you know, it was not Zwicky's ideas that were influencing them to do this work. They come, came at it from a completely different angle. And they were looking at individual galaxies. So she was looking at spiral galaxies, looking at the motions of stars in spiral galaxies from the center outward, tracking how fast they were moving and trying to figure out how much gravity you needed, therefore how much matter you needed to hold the galaxy together. And she found, so she plotted this thing which is called a rotation curve, which is just the speed of stars as a function of distance from the center of the galaxy. And so what she, what she measured was that white and that's puzzling because what should have been there is once the galaxy stars, you run out of stars in a galaxy, that's sort of like an edge. And so what you expect is the red curve. It thinks you really fall off as you go outside because there's less and less matter as you go outside, right? And so this was very puzzling. In fact, they found this and they waited for a while because it seemed really puzzling. It suggested, literally, that there was matter at the outskirts of galaxies that was holding out galaxies that was unseen, dark matter, right? And so this was not a one-hit wonder. They saw this in many galaxies. Uh, wasn't one peculiar galaxy. So many spiral galaxies and other kinds of early um, type elliptical galaxies appear to have these, they're called flat rotation curves. They're basically flat at large radius, indicative of the presence of additional gravitating matter at the outskirts that was literally holding up the galaxy. And you might say, okay, why is, this, why is this so peculiar? Okay, so let's look at the solar system where, so you know, we, are, we have a much more familiar system, right? The sun is the most massive body in the solar system. It's sitting in the center. And you look at the speeds of the planets around the sun. As you go further and further away from the sun, Newton's laws tell you that you fall off. The speed has to fall off because you're moving away from the most gravitationally important body in the solar system. So yeah, I mean, I still have a bit of a blind spot. Pluto for me is still a planet because I can't give up my childhood tidy view of the solar system. So at any rate, you see the, uh, that the speeds of the planets tells you that the most gravitatingly most important body in the universe, uh, in, the, sorry, in the solar system, is the sun and it's at the center. So in contrast, if I show you what the rotation curves, the speeds of stars in a galaxy looks like, it looks like that. So that is telling you that the distribution of matter in a galaxy 
fundamentally different from something like the solar system. Although the galaxy has a lot of bright stars in the center that kind of ooze off as you go outside, that's not where most of the mass is. Most of the mass is actually spread out all the way out. So that's why it was peculiar, and so she suggested, and then it became quite accepted, the idea that there was huge amounts of dark matter in the universe. But the really compelling evidence came from the bending of light and from Einstein's idea of how gravity works. So this is a cartoon that shows you we have a distant galaxy, light from that galaxy takes many paths to come to us. So here we are on Earth opening our telescopes and gathering the light. And so you see that what you have in between us and this distant source of light is a cluster of galaxies. That's what is shown in those little fuzzy um, galaxy cluster um, cartoon in the center. And so the, because where the divot is the deepest, you have the strongest deformation in the paths of light rays. So like the orange path is most bent because it's going down and up the deepest part of um, the pothole. And so the way that manifests is you end up seeing distorted shapes of distant galaxies. So you don't see the galaxies that lie beyond as they really are, but you see their shapes really stretched out. And that stretching out is only because of the pothole in space-time that this intervening blob of mass has generated. So it really acts as a lens. So these are called cluster lenses because they deform, you know, just like the optical lenses, we have concave and convex lenses matter acting as a lens for light. So, and this is seen. So this is a Hubble Space Telescope image of a highly distorted background galaxy that has gotten completely twisted around because of the large amount of dark matter that is there associated with the galaxy that lies between us and this object. So a lot of the work that, um, that I have been uh, spending time and energy on the last decade or so is developing these techniques that will undo this uh, bending of light, this extreme, to then reveal what the original undistorted shape looks like. So on the right-hand side here, you can see us undoing the work. So what in effect is this little blue fuzzy galaxy is what, that's the real shape of the galaxy, and the light from that galaxy passes through uh, an intervening lens that is an individual galaxy with its own big dark matter halo like where Rubin and others found that is extended, so 10 times more matter than you would infer from just the light, which causes a really deep pothole in space-time between us and this blue blob, and that distorts the shape of the galaxy. And you can see we can reproduce and match the distortion that is seen in the Hubble image. So we are able to really trace the light that is going through the bottle in space-time and map out what the distorted shape looks like. And in fact, there's some extreme things that happen. If you can think of light as a tube, then it turns out that when this tube of light traverses the deepest part of the pothole, it actually splits. It gets split into many beams. So you see this very peculiar effect. You see multiple copies, images, of what is in effect, in reality, a single object. So you see five copies of the same thing, and blurred, of course, and bent. So here is a case where we see five copies, and I have outlined for you the locations of those five images that are shown as A, B, C, and D here. And there's a fifth one that is in the center, and I have not marked it on purpose because I want you guys to look for it. So this is an intervening cluster of galaxies. That's the yellow fuzzy galaxies are part of a cluster. And there's about 10 times more dark matter there than you can see because that's the amount of dark matter you need to produce this kind of extreme distortion that is seen. So you can imagine, so one of the reasons, so you know, I was doing, uh, finishing my PhD, and right after I finished, this was the time when the Hubble Space Telescope optics were getting so good that we could start doing exquisite imaging and finding these highly distorted, multiply imaged objects. And the reason why this is interesting and important is that because we know how the light bending works in detail from general relativity, we can then figure out how much matter you need in that yellow region that you see. That's the region where you see maximal distortions of background galaxies. You can map out how the matter has to be clumped in that region. 
So it turns out, as I mentioned earlier, that you have 10 times more matter than you would infer from just the light in the stars, from the masses of stars. So a lot of my early work was figuring out the techniques to do this mapping, to render a dark matter map, to tell you how the dark matter is spatially distributed in this cluster of galaxies that behaves like a, an extreme lens. And so this is um, an image, this is a Hubble Space Telescope image, where we've reconstructed the mass distribution, the amount of dark matter that you don't actually see. And so I show you in blue the distribution of dark matter that is there, because it is required to produce the light bending that you actually measure from the distorted shapes. So you can see that the dark matter is distributed sort of rather like the light, but it's much more extended. It extends out quite further, um, further out. And so this is the latest image, this is sort of the hottest data set, it's one of the deepest images of a cluster of galaxies. That sort of banana shaped thing that you see there is actually several clusters in the process of forming, they're kind of crashing into each other. Very massive, huge amounts of dark matter, extreme, extreme lens in the universe, lots of distortions of sources that are behind this cluster. And so here is a reconstructed dark matter map. And so this is a rendering of just the dark matter the clumps of dark matter there and their spatial distribution. You might say, well, why is, why is Priya wasting her time you know, drawing up little maps of clumps of dark matter and what does it mean? So the reason this is really important is that we have a theoretical prediction, as I told you, of how dark matter is in the driving seat of forming structure. And what you see here is a slice from a simulation. This is all dark matter. It's mocked up to look like light all dark matter, and the regions that are yellow are the regions that are clumped, that are extremely clumped. So they correspond to the peaks, the mountain peaks that I'm showing you here with the same color scheme. These are the peaks. This is the top view of the peaks that you're seeing. So this is a slice of the universe. And these peaks are the places where galaxies form. So the dark matter, the regions where dark matter is heaped are the regions where galaxies actually form although the dark matter provides most of the gravity and most of the mass that you, that you don't actually see. And the nature of dark matter, I told you, that's a big open question. And it turns out that we can play in a simulation, we can do a computer simulation, ascribe different natures to the dark matter particle, see how it lumps and clumps, and then compare with the data and see what's the model that works best. So what is shown here are a bunch of simulations so this is one in which you have two galaxies that are crashing into each other, and you can see the dark matter and the gas, and you can see the um, extent, the spatial extent of the distribution of dark matter. And here you can see another simulation, once again, of dark matter that shows you how a cluster, like the one whose lensing effects we just saw, how that would assemble. So once again, this is all dark matter mocked up to look like light. But what you see is this dark matter does not collide. So we believe that the particle, this dark matter particle, has a lot of other additional properties. We figured that out. And those properties are they're very lazy particles. They move very slowly. They're very sluggish. And that they interact only via gravity. They don't have charge, so there are no charged. Um, they don't interact with light. They, barely interact with each other, if at all, very weakly. So in fact, they just interact, they have matter, they interact with gravity. So all the flows that you are seeing that I'm showing you in the simulation, these flows of dark matter, it's all generated just by gravity. It's just gravity is the only thing. So you have a small lump that forms here, and because there's a little excess of matter, it pulls in matter in all other directions. So then this lump gets stronger and it grows bigger, and then there's a little lump that grows here. So all the flows that you see that our theory predicts are um, actually driven entirely by gravity. So when I first started doing this work, I thought, oh great, so I'm going to become really famous because I'm going to show that the way the dark matter is clumped that we infer from lensing does not tally with this peculiar theory of dark matter that we have. These slow particles, it's called cold dark matter. So far, I've shown you with you know, ever increasing sophistication and refinement in these maps that I've shown you, cold dark matter looks correct so far. So, you know, 
not been able to overthrow or question that theory. I mean, there are some questions about, you know, uh, for details of that theory, but by and large, it looks like that is still the most apt uh, description for the dark matter that we don't see in the universe. So let me just go and wrap up with the final idea, the final radical idea, one that is really close to my heart, and of course, which um, a lot of Sierra people are involved in working, um, which is black holes. So um, black holes are some of the most enigmatic objects in the universe, because if you remember, I told you what a black hole does in terms of gravitationally, it's so intense, it's so compact, causes a puncture in space-time. So when I started writing my book, I started looking into sort of the history of the word black hole. Before it was used in astrophysics, it turns out it was a very common word, and it originated, um, strangely enough, uh, from an infamous prison. It was the name of an infamous prison in Calcutta, in India. And I happen to be of Indian origin, so it was really fascinating that, you know, and a scientific idea and that phrase actually, but it's a pretty macabre uh, origin. So it referred to a prison which was a place of no return. So some um, soldiers from the British East India Company were overnight, they were imprisoned by the local Nawab in this little room and almost nobody made it out. So it was called the Black Hole. It was called the Black Hole of Calcutta. And um, it turns out that the point of no return seems to be a very apt description for this enigmatic cosmic object as we will see in just a minute. So there, there were precursors to the idea of cosmic objects that were so massive so in Newton's time, it was believed that light was made up of particles, of corpuscles. They were called the corpuscles of light, and that uh, and these particles moving was what light was. And so you can imagine, um, as John Mitchell did, that then you could have objects, you could have a star that was so massive that light particles would come and they would get gravitationally attracted to the star and would glom on, and that's it. So the star would be dark. It would eat light, as it were, right? The particles of light. So that's not quite what a black hole is, but you know, it's a dark object, right? And so this idea, um, then it turns out that Einstein's equations, so this idea of um, the shape of space, geometry, the mass of the object, it turns out that one mathematical solution that is permitted, the first one that was discovered for Einstein's theory of general relativity, was a solution where you have a very tiny point mass, like a point-like mass, and what that does to the shape of space right around it. And so that was found by Schwarzschild soon after Einstein gave his lectures uh, when he presented his theory. Within six months, Schwarzschild had found the solution. And so this was an extreme distortion of space and a very, very uncomfortable object at the center, which is called the singularity, which is where all our known laws of physics and everything breaks down. Einstein did not like the solution. And he thought, well, it's a mathematical solution. It cannot correspond to any real object. Nature is not so perverse. So this idea remained a mathematical idea for a very long time. It was like a curious mathematical solution. And no one really believed that it could correspond to real objects. Till um, Chandrasekhar came along and showed along with um, Oppenheimer and others, that the end state of a star, a throbbing star, could end its life. Some stars, massive stars, could end their life as little black holes. So these are the black holes that the LIGO collaboration has now discovered collide with each other, right? So it turns out the uh, existence of more massive black holes. So the black holes that uh, LIGO has detected uh, colliding with each other, producing gravitational waves in the universe, um, that, you know, a project that uh, Vicky Calavera and others from Sierra have been very actively involved in these amazing discoveries in the last couple of years, you know, those are the tiny cousins of the sort of more obese characters that I am much more interested in. They are super massive black holes. These weigh about a million to a billion times the mass of the sun. And so their existence was actually inferred much, much later when quasars were discovered. And quasars, it turns out, as we'll see in a minute, are growing, actively growing supermassive black holes. So once again, to remind you, so black holes cause extreme distortion of the shape of space around them. And in fact, they do something very, very peculiar to light. They obviously bend light, so they lens light too. But there is a sacred boundary to a black hole that is called the event horizon. 
So when, that's marked in this dashed white line, so when light crosses the event horizon, in fact, when anything crosses the event horizon, matter, what have you, unfortunate bystander who falls in, you are at the point of no return. Okay? There's no information um, can be recovered from inside the event horizon once um, it passes the end. So for example, light that goes down the event horizon is lost, so you can no longer recover that light. But then there are some interesting regions outside, so you have this other radius outside the event horizon where light could orbit forever in limbo, right? It would be captured there, and it would, it's called the photon radius. And then, of course, light rays that kind of get close, but not that close, will just get slightly deformed and they will make, um, make their way out. So you might ask, where are these supermassive black holes? So it turns out that we now believe that almost every galaxy, if not all, harbors a supermassive black hole in its center. So that was a Hubble Space Telescope image, and now we're moving to an artist's rendition as we are zooming right in, because that's not resolvable. That's so tiny in the right at the center of the galaxy. But this is our current picture. So you have a black hole that's sitting right at the center there. It's a little speck. And around it, in red, you see this swirling disk of gas. And this is the gas that is going to feed the black hole. And so when this gas gets pulled in by the gravity of the black hole, it gets heated up, it starts glowing, and that's what we see. So we see, we can never see the black hole itself, but we see the dying gasps of gas as it's making its way into the black hole. And then black holes, we also know, as you are heating and energy is released when this gas is falling into the black hole, it can also drive jets and spew out stuff. So black holes can dribble, they feed pretty badly, so they can also dribble and they put out jets of matter, of energy, radiation, and so on. And those are seen. So it turns out that black holes in the universe come in two states. They're either fasting or they're feasting. So black holes that are feasting are what that are, you know, that are really gobbling up a lot of gas, pulling the gas in from the accretion disk, that's called, that's the name for the disk of gas that surrounds the feeding disk. They're, and it's feasting, you see these objects are quasars, they're some of the brightest beacons in the universe, you can see them out to great distances um, from us. Then you have black holes that are fasting, like the one in the center of the Milky Way, which is a tiny, tiny trickle, if at all, of gas. And this is likely because either you've evacuated all the gas, you've fed all the gas, and you've gotten rid of your reservoir, and therefore you have nothing more to feed on. So that is often the case. And so they transit from one to the other, and the way they transit from one to the other, I'll just show you in a minute. So these are bright quasars. Um, this is a bright quasar, and uh, it's the same image. And you can see when you don't remove the quasar, you don't see the underlying galaxy that it's at the black hole is at the center of. When I remove the quasar light, which is very sharp, very bright, you can see the galaxy shows up. So a quasar is so bright that it outshines the galaxy that it's sitting in, okay? but that, which is why you can see them to great distances. You might say, okay, so what is the most compelling evidence for a black hole? So this is the most compelling evidence. This is a movie from Andrea Goetz and her collaborators at UCLA who've been following the motions. This is real data taken over the years that you see there of stars that are right around the black hole. And what you saw as this little gas red blob swing by was a gas blob that came very close and we were all very excited. We thought, oh, if the black hole in the center of the Milky Way gobbles it up, you would see a dramatic flare, which we did not see. But what you see is a future prediction of another time and it's going to swing by around and then we might see something. We can see the black hole in the center of the Milky Way that is currently fasting have a little bit of food fed to it um, in the future. So those orbits actually show you that there is a very massive central object at the center of the Milky Way consistent with the supermassive black hole. And so this is an image that you could not have escaped. It came out, it was produced uh, earlier this year in April. And this is as close as we have gotten in terms of getting a direct light signal from a supermassive black hole. And so this was the Event Horizon Telescope project. They uh, released this image. And what you see is the bending of light, this photon radius, if you will, that I told you where light is eternally captured, 
um, around a supermassive black hole that is 6.5 billion times the mass of the sun in a nearby galaxy. And so this is the nearest, the closest in, this is as close as we have scored it to the event horizon of a black hole. It's quite a remarkable achievement. Coming back to what, you know, how do black holes actually grow and in the universe, I told you about how these feeding episodes get triggered. So it turns out that most galaxies in the universe merge with each other, they collide. The early universe is a very violent place. Galaxies collide and they grow and they merge. And when two galaxies that each harbors a black hole grows, the final black hole also, black holes also merge, grow, and they also give out, like the LIGO black holes, they give out a burst of gravitational waves. They shake the entire fabric of space-time when that happens. Of course, one of these events has not yet been detected. We know it should happen, um, but we've not yet detected it. And um, so I just wanted to remind you that you know the LIGO collaboration and what an amazing technical feat this discovery was. And so you must have all seen this, and this is, you know, this is a graph showing you of the number, this is a census of the nearby tiny cousins of my favorite black holes. And this is from the LIGO data. And this picture is changing so rapidly that this one is already out of date from, uh, from, uh, from the end of last year. So they just had a run and there were many, many more events. So if you look, let's jump back to the supermassive black holes whose collisions we have not yet detected. Um, so what are the prospects? So it turns out that there were recently a breakthrough in computational uh, methodologies that have allowed us to actually calculate exactly what kind of gravitational wave signatures you might get from uh, those collisions. So these are two versions that were, one was produced by Franz Pretorius and his group in Princeton and the other by Manuela Campanelli and her collaborators at the Rochester Institute of Technology. So this is kind of showing you that on the right hand side you see sort of this grid of space and you see how this grid of space gets shaken up as these two black holes start to grind up close and then finally merge. And so as I mentioned, the, uh, the project, so there is an idea out to measure these and that's a European satellite called LISA. NASA is part of that. Um, I'm part of the NASA LISA team. And so one of the reasons we have not yet discovered is that the frequency of the gravitational waves that should be produced by the merger of two supermassive black holes is much lower. And so you need these detectors out in space to do this, um, this measurement. And so this is what is planned. So LIGO, just to give you a contrast, remember it had these four kilometer arms uh, and you were looking at the deformation of uh, space when a gravitational wave goes by in these two arms. By comparison, to detect these lower frequency gravitational waves that should come from the coalescence of supermassive black holes, this project, the arms, are 2.5 million kilometers. So it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a formation of, it's a set of satellites, a configured set of satellites which have arms, and this will actually be able to, this instrument will be able to detect gravitational waves. And so this project um, is, uh, we hope it will fly in the next 10 to 20 years. And so let me just uh, stop here and um, just show you um, the cover of my book in case you want to read more about um, these ideas. A little bit more of the, you know, what I didn't delve into here is sort of the human side of science and the psychological side of science and how a lot of these people who came up with the radical um, ideas, the opposition that they faced from within the scientific community, and how that eventually got surmounted with better data, more persuasive evidence uh, for the idea. So thank you so much for your attention, and I'd be delighted to answer questions. Thank you. Thank you, Rita. So indeed, uh, we will have a little time for questions. You can ask questions, just raise your hand, I'll point to you, and wait for the mic to come to you. So let's start, I'll try to be going from all sides of the room. The first hand I saw is back there. Hi, uh, as you mentioned, the universe is continuously expanding and the galaxies are uh, expanding 
So my question is, how do they collide, and how does their uh, uh, black holes like form one giant black? Hole? Thanks. Right. Uh, so, um, so the question, so uh, the question is that the universe as a whole is expanding. As I mentioned, what that means is the spaces between galaxies uh, is actually growing, right? But then you have regions where you have aggregates of galaxies as part of the formation process. So those regions where you have an excess of galaxies, it's the local gravity that dominates. So things are going to be pulled in together and they crash into each other. So uh, maybe see if I can find that image that will give you a better feel. So here. So you can see that there are many, many nodes. So local, there's one big sort of blob that you see that's a gravitationally dominant block. But then there are all these little nodes. So these are local regions where the gravity, local gravity dominates over the overall expansion. This is beyond, yes. It's, it's countervails the expansion of the universe. So there are regions where you countervail the expansion of the universe, and galaxies crash into each other. And when galaxies crash into each other, the dark matter will get redistributed. The dark matter halo that surrounds the two galaxies will get redistributed. The stars will get redistributed. Some will get spilled out and thrown out. And the central black holes, if both galaxies harbor a black hole in their center, they will kind of merge, as I showed you towards the end, uh, for sort of the new computational breakthrough of how the, uh, the two black holes will emerge. Next. Let's take one from that side right there. Um, thank you for this. It was great. Thank you. Um, and given that I, I don't have a degree in astrophysics, <laughs> you made it very understandable. But I do have a question, mm -hmm. um, just out of curiosity. Given the high percentage of um, dark matter and dark energy, does that mean that um, our solar system actually also contains the same? It's a great question. So it turns out that given the position of our solar system, relative to the center of the galaxy, by the time you get out that far, there really isn't all that much dark matter. In fact, it's quite uncertain how much dark matter there should be. So there's dark matter going through this room, right? So the rate is fiddly, and as I told you, dark matter is very inert and lazy. Thankfully, in a way, right? Otherwise, can you imagine a dark matter particle that was really robust going through, it would like completely reshape the atoms in our bodies, right? So it just goes through. So that's part of the problem, the uncertainty in the rate of flow of dark matter, why we've not yet detected it, because it goes pretty undetected. And so one of the ways in which people are trying to look for dark matter, the experiments, right? So they have these inert gases, which, you know, xenon and stuff, you can think of them really as, they're not gases, they're actually, think of them as a crystal. And you got crystal, you have these atoms that are held together by springs, like the crystalline structure. And so they're waiting for a dark matter particle to go through and jiggle the springs. Okay, so that's, and of course you have to isolate it. It's usually underground. You don't want a truck going by to jiggle and get confused, um, and so on. But it's been very, very challenging, and we are always questioning whether we have the rates right. Is that why we have not detected this particle? Or maybe it's a fundamentally different kind of particle. It's a much lighter particle. So we've been fixated on one kind of particle, so they're candidates, and the favorite particle is called the neutralino. But we're, you know, it's like the drunk looking for the keys under the lamppost. That is sort of where we can look, and now we've kind of exhausted one lamppost, and we're like, maybe we should move to the next lamppost, right? And that's where we are. And so there's a new class of candidates. You'll be reading about them in the papers, they do new experiments, where we think the lighter particle called an axion might be a better candidate. So that's where we are. Yeah. But that's a great question. Question. I see an arm uh, actually at the front was first. Yes, where I had Thank you. It was really interesting. Um, I I just wonder the computer software you must use the applications that you use to simulate some of what is observed. Yeah. How reliable slash sophisticated are those? I mean, doubting me, I don't know how beautifully they, they've been pictured, but I wonder if you can talk a little bit about that. Yeah, that's a great question, and it's quite a profound and deep question, right? Because one of the peculiar things about cosmology is that we, A, have only one universe. So uh, in terms of science, right, in terms of replicating experiments, 
we can't replicate anything, right? A supernova goes off here, I cannot arrange for it to go off here tomorrow or there, right? So what you see is what you have. And so the numerical simulations that I was showing you results of, right? So what informs them is a set of initial conditions that we know that we have pinned down quite well with various data sets across wavelengths in the universe. And then we make an assumption that gravity is the dominant force. And so these computer simulations move forward. They propagate the positions and velocities of particles that you start out with an initial fluctuation spectrum, which is very well motivated. And then you move it forward to mimic the present time. And then you try to, the, I, I, what you try to do is to see which representation of particle aggregates, galaxies, and things that you form, best matches statistically the properties of the universe. So you look at pretty higher order statistics as well to see that you are able to reproduce patches of the sky. And now we have surveyed most of the night sky. And so you know we can look at individual patches. We have an idea of the variation amongst the patches in the night sky. And so we can then do the same kinds of statistical analysis with the computer models that we generate. So we have a pretty robust kind of methodology, but it is a very peculiar science because this is one of the sciences where you can't do controlled experiments. <coughs> so this is a question we often uh, wonder if some of the initial conditions were off, then, Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, oh, okay. My question, and maybe it's irrelevant, but I was wondering if dark matter energy and energy, is there any evidence that they're influenced by black holes? Is there some kind of correlation that is... Well, you know, you can imagine, right? My, like, fantasy solution is they're all somehow related. <laughs> the entire dark, <laughs> dark phenomenology, dark matter, dark energy, black holes. Alas, it doesn't seem so. So, for example, um, when uh, you have a supermassive black hole sitting in the center of a galaxy, as I said, it pulls in matter, pulls in gas. It would pull in dark matter too, um, but it turns out that galaxies are objects where the ordinary matter is really heaped much more in the center than, uh, than dark matter. So the trickle rate of dark matter that's going into a black hole is really negligible compared to ordinary matter that goes in. But you know, there's a, uh, your question seems very prescient because recently there was a lot of excitement over a possibility that all of dark matter could have been made of little black holes. Like black holes that LIGO was detecting, right? 30 times the mass of the sun, 50 times the mass of the sun, under 100 times the mass of the sun, basically. And you know, could that work? So it turns out that doesn't quite work. And then there have been other ideas where people try to connect dark matter and dark energy. That doesn't work either. So we've not yet sort of figured out, but I think at the moment they appear to be three distinct sets of material things that um, have independent descriptions. So I have to take the question of the gentleman here, yes. No, 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 I'm sorry. It's like the third time he's trying. Yes. <laughs> I'm sorry. Thank you, Doctor, for the uh, lecture. I was actually not expecting this kind of mapping uh, to show you my Newtonian uh, orientation. I was expecting to see uh, essentially the distribution of matter throughout the universe and those kinds of structures. Um, does that um, structure have any bearing on the distribution of dark matter? Has it essentially traveled with that distribution? Absolutely. So as I mentioned earlier, um, the current picture that we have is that light and dark matter and galaxies trace each other with pretty high fidelity. So wherever you see a galaxy, there's a lot of dark matter that's associated with it. So essentially dark matter is smeared everywhere in the universe 
very lightly everywhere, but it's lumped in places, and those places where dark matter is lumped are the places where galaxies and therefore light stars form. So they are very tightly correlated. The locations where galaxies form are the regions where dark matter is heaped and it's curved. So a map of dark matter that I showed you, so for example, let me just show you um, once again the um, here. So you can see the blue haze is the reconstructed distribution of dark matter. Spatial distribution of dark matter, those lumps that I showed you in the next map, I just extracted only the dark matter there. But here you can see overlaid on the light where you see that cluster of galaxies, it's the same image there. You just see overlaid the dark matter that you don't see but is inferred to be there because of the extreme distortions in the shapes, the bending in the shapes of distant galaxies that lie beyond this uh, structure. One last question. Let me make sure. Okay, <coughs> I'm gonna take, just checking there, on the edge there. I think it's a student question. So let's give it a little time. So I was wondering if there's like a if there's like matter and antimatter, is there kind of like a dark matter and kind of like an equal and opposite that kind of you know? Yeah. Great question. Um, so it turns out that very early on in the universe, we should have had equal amounts of matter and dark matter. But it turns out that there is appears to be a fundamental asymmetry in our universe. We don't actually seem to have detected any antimatter at all. So uh, we believe that our universe or the patch of our universe appears to be dominated just by matter. So by that same construction, we don't expect any sort of anti-dark matter um, uh, either. We still think that it, since it's part of the matter inventory, we don't expect um, anti-dark matter either. But that's a great question. So uh, we're going to close with the questions now, but let me make a couple of announcements. First of all, there is a team of young Sierra astronomers outside that they are waiting for you. If you have more questions, they will be happy to take them, answer, have more discussions with you, so you're, feel free to stick around. Also, there's surveys that have been circulated or you can find them outside. If you fill them in and if you, feel, if you leave your email address, we'll have a raffle with books, um, uh, copies of books, uh, previous books with her uh, signature. So we will email you if you have one. Thank you for coming tonight. Uh, and I hope to see you at other Sierra public events. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.